If you're starting a new project or moving an existing project to a microservices architecture, how are you primarily communicating between services? Are you using a RESTful HTTP API or maybe gRPC? Before you commit to that, I'm going to explain the complexities you're going to have to deal with in terms of latency and availability when using request response in a distributed system. Hey everybody, it's Derek Martin from CodeOpinion.com. If you recently subscribed to my channel, thank you. I really appreciate the support. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. So if you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. All right, so first let's compare this to a monolith and how this would typically work. A monolith, you're gonna have a single process that's likely gonna have a single database. And regardless of whether you have boundaries within your monolith, let's say for example, we're creating an order and that's within sales and it's interacting with the catalog. Maybe billing has to create an invoice record and the warehouse portion has to update the quantity on hand for what we just are about to ship out. But all that's done within a transaction. So if there's a failure at any point through any of that interactions between billing, warehouse, and sales, it's atomic. It's either gonna work or it's not gonna work. So we don't have to worry about any inconsistencies of data of like portion of the process working. It's all gonna work or it's not all gonna work. It's either gonna succeed together or fail together. So the first issue now is if once we move to a distributed system and have all these services, each service has its own database. So we can't have a single transaction to handle this. So for example, we call the catalog to get some information. Then we make a synchronous call over, say again, maybe HTTP to billing saying, okay, create this invoice for this particular order. It returns okay, 200 okay that it worked. Then we make a call to the warehouse to create the shipping label and maybe to allocate the quantity um, that we're requesting for particular products that are, that are on our order. What happens if that fails? Maybe the service isn't available or there's actually just a 500 error. Something occurs that we couldn't actually process that request. Well, now we need to go back to billing to tell it, okay, that invoice we created, undo that. Don't do that. We don't want to create that invo invoice anymore because something else went wrong. But what happens if that fails? Now we have an invoice that we've created that we haven't allocated the inventory for, and we're in this really inconsistent state. So the problem now is since we don't have a single transaction, we need a distributed transaction. One solution to that is having a transaction coordinator that can do a two-phase commit. There is another solution, but before I get to it, I'm gonna show another problem. So the second issue we need to deal with is latency. So we have a client that's making a call to sales, and let's say that the sales service is using HTTP to make a call to the warehouse for allocating product for our particular order that we're creating. So we make that call, but do you know how long the actual timeout is? In a perfect world, let's say that the warehouse for that particular uh, request is a couple hundred milliseconds. Happy path, it's all good. We don't really care. We just know that the warehouse does what it does. But do you set the default timeout all the time when you're making HTTP calls? Do you know what the default is for the C-sharp HTTP client? If you go to the docs and you look up the HTTP client timeout, you may be uh, surprised to find out that the default value is 100 seconds. So when sales need to make that call to the warehouse, all of a sudden, if that warehouse has some performance issues, availability issues, where it's taking in requests, but they're taking a long time to process, you could wait up 100 seconds before you get a task completed exception because of the timeout. But it can get worse because if you're kind of in the sales service and that's the part that you're working on, and you're just saying, okay, I just make, need to call them and make to the warehouse, you have no idea what else is going behind the scenes of the warehouse. You can't see a stack trace that shows this. You're not in process. What happens if the warehouse makes a call to billing? And just like I said before, that on the happy path works out great. And then billing also needs to make a call to the catalog. You, again, you have no idea from the concept of sales from that particular view that all this is occurring. And you, now you have this call chain over HP from service to service to service. So how is that gonna add up with latency? So if that call from billing to catalog, let's say took 200 milliseconds, and then the call from the warehouse to billing took 200 milliseconds, now we're at a uh, 400 millisecond round trip so far. And then let's say just for example, there's another 200 milliseconds, so now we're at 600 milliseconds just to get from the client to sales. And from our sales point of view, all we were doing was making a call to the warehouse. So we decide to add a timeout in our request from sales to the warehouse. 
But the problem is, is that the warehouse might not actually even be the problem. And we don't know that because we don't know what's going beyond the warehouse and what it's doing. But we know that through illustration right here that the warehouse was calling billing, billing was calling the catalog. So we add our timeout and then it actually turns out that the catalog is actually the one calling, causing the issue because it's having a uh, terrible performance and maybe the length of time it was taking for billing to call the catalog is adding up to say 700 milliseconds and then the warehouse the billing was adding another 200 to that and let's say that we had a timeout of 500 milliseconds well we're going to bail out and it's not really the warehouse's fault necessarily it's that farther down the chain is really where our issue is of the catalog so if you're creating services and you're doing request response to communicate with other services to me, the problem is you really turn this into a distributed monolith. And it's actually in a lot of cases, in my opinion, worse. Because if you're really just taking the same concept of what you had in a monolith, where you have all these interactions, they went from in process to out of process over the network. Let's say we have sales that communicates to the warehouse. Uh, the warehouse communicates to billing. Everything communicates to the catalog. Well, what happens if the catalog has an issue? If you have no recourse, if that has a particular issue, then the reality of it is everything's on fire. Nothing's gonna work. So if one service is down, all the services are down. So one solution to some of these problems is directly because of the request response. In order to get rid of this request response, we need to move to asynchronous messaging. So one way to be doing this is using a message broker, using messaging with events and orchestration to get rid of the temporal coupling you have and kind of embrace the asynchrony of the whole thing. So I've mentioned this before in some of my videos, so check some of the videos related uh, to the Saga video that I have. This is what some of this is related to. But when you place an order, we send that to the message broker. The me message broker, we have an orchestrator that's kind of dealing with our long running process. And all of this is asynchronous. So there's no request response going here. We're just sending messages to a message broker and our message broker is then dealing with the other services uh, and we're not going from service to service directly. So we have our bill order, billing does say creates that invoice, then it sends a separate event back that our orchestrator is dealing with in sales to say, okay, it was actually billed. Then we go to create our shipping label in the warehouse to allocate our product, but the warehouse maybe isn't available or there's an issue there. That's no concern to us in sales. That message will just get stacked up and as any other messages that actually come through, they'll just get stacked up as well. And once the warehouse becomes available and it's back online and processing messages quickly, it'll consume all those messages basically that are in its queue. So is asynchronous messaging the golden hammer that solves all problems? No, of course not. It's trade-offs like everything else, but it does solve the problems that I outlined. And when you're doing request response through services, and dealing with the latency that might occur and the availability that's gonna cause issues and how you're gonna deal with all that can get very complex. You kinda of need to break away from the temporal coupling of the request response and just embrace asynchrony. Another thing to look at is boundaries. If you have services that are making synchronous calls to other services to, for example, get data, then you may wanna look at your boundaries to see if they're actually correct. You want services to be a set of capabilities, to be the authority of a set of capabilities. And behind that is the data that it owns. If you have to go out to another service to get data, maybe you have some boundaries that aren't aligned correctly. So the last thing I wanna to touch on is the reality that you will need to do request response in certain situations. So let's say that my client here is some sales um, service and I need to get some currency exchange from one currency to another. So we have this primary service, let's say it's a currency exchange, where I pass it, hey, I have one US dollar, I wanna know how much that is right now in Canadian, because that fluctuates and it changes. And th that can't be messaging, we need to get a, a response immediately from that. So whether we're talking about something being available or it being slow and having an expectation of how long, how quickly that's gonna return, you either, you have a couple options, one is, if there is a failure, can you still process whatever your request is without getting that result? Can you be resilient to that service being down? If you can, then great. If you can't, then you need to have the expectation that if the primary service is down, that you can immediately go to some other service that can give you the result for you. 
So always kind of have a, a fallback is if something fails, then immediately go to the fallback. If you have some timeout set up, that's some reasonable expectation where you're expecting it to be done in 500 milliseconds. And if it doesn't, immediately go to the secondary service, that's your fallback. And then like I have in quotes here is possibly fail over. You don't wanna, for every request, have to check the primary, oh, it's still down, go to the secondary. Have some failover in place that you can just immediately keep going to the secondary until you know the primary is back up and then you can flip back over to it. So when you absolutely have to do request response and it's critical that you actually have a value from that service, make sure you have fallbacks. If you're gonna go the request response route with communicating between services, realize the issues that you're gonna face with latency and availability, especially when we're talking about long running processes or workflows where you need to communicate to multiple services. And if anything goes wrong, you need to either have some distributed transaction or two phase commit or your own complexities of trying to sort that out when failures occur. To me, services should be autonomous and I much prefer using messaging and a message broker to communicate between my services. If you're interested more in that, make sure to check out a bunch of my videos on sagas, event orchestration, and choreography. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give a thumbs up. And of course, if you haven't done so already, make sure to subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.